Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, what a fascinating conversation with Diane Francis, columnist uh, from the National Post. And she's arguing that uh, we need to open up right away, uh, that uh, statistics uh, that have now come out uh, in North America prove that only people above the age of 65 or people with pre-existing conditions are, uh, are susceptible to, uh, to the infection and the mortality infection. Other people get infected, but uh, they seem to recover reasonably well. And more importantly, she's arguing that we need to do this for the health of the economy. The economy is going to be devastated if we don't uh, open up right away. So I thought what I'd do is I would check in with uh, Hussein Ahmed. He's the founder and president of Yorkville Asset Management. He's been on my show twice before. Incredibly smart uh, gentleman. Um, actually, I was at a session that uh, he had in October no, sorry, in January in Ottawa, where he said that there was a one in five chance for a recession. And that was before we ever even heard of the word COVID-19, or I think it was one of the little lines on, on your uh, presentation, uh, Hussein. Um, Hussein, what do you think? Should we open up? And if so, how quickly? And what do you think if we do open up or don't open up, what's the implication for the economy? Sure. Uh, I think uh, opening up is, a, is the inevitable at the end of the day, at some point in time. However, how do we open up and how do we proceed from where we are now? Uh, and the speed of it will depend on multiple factors. One of the things is the readiness of the healthcare system. Um, as you know, if we open up and you could see a spike in cases or deaths, how ready is the healthcare system? In the first wave, we've heard about shortage in ven ventilators, medical uh, supplies, and so forth. So is has the government used uh, the time uh, so far, the last eight weeks, call it eight weeks or longer, to procure enough equipment and supplies and to get the hospitals ready and everybody in the system to deal with this another wave or surge of cases. So I think with that's number one where I would look at is that preparedness of the healthcare system. The second component which is being addressed is how ready is the government uh, in terms of its monetary and fiscal policy to support the businesses, because we're going to see significant volatility in terms of how business, we're not talking about stock prices, but more their revenue model works because, um, or their expense model works because you, some, some employees might decide to go back to work. Some will opt not to go back to work. Some are in a position where they live too far from where they work that they have to commute and public transit. So the government, in terms of preparedness to deal with all these issues, it's not just about opening the economy. As an employer, I have to worry about how do I get an employee to the office, to, to the manufacturing facility, and so forth. So I would think that's the second thing we have to take a look at in terms of uh, the government preparedness. The third, the businesses itself. There's some element of moral, ethical, or even uh, legal liability on an employer that says to their employees, I need you to go back to work and uh, God forbids an event happens to a single mom or a single dad uh, or an elderly person, uh, that, that is moral hazard of some sort that a business has to accept uh, and take on as they move forward. Uh, and last but not least, what I would think ultimately will decide how fast we move forward is how close we are in the process of finding a solution, a vaccine of some sort. Because ultimately, uh, if we don't have COVID-19, we're going to have COVID-2020 and COVID-2021. Uh, how close are we in the science of finding a vaccine and getting it out as quickly as possible? And of course, every day that passes by from that January 2nd, uh, or November 18th, whenever coronavirus started hitting global media, uh, more and more companies are allocating dollars and researchers and facilities to finding a vaccine. So with the passage of time, we get naturally closer to finding some sort of vaccine. So if you look at those, all those factors together, you can extrapolate a business model for an economy that should start to be opening, which is what the government is doing now, uh, with mainly essential services, but a lot of the stuff that is non-essential uh, will probably have to be delayed substantially. We've seen Amex, we've seen Visa, uh, we've seen multiple US firms telling their employees, you're gonna continue working from home all the way till the end of the year. We're not gonna even, even if there's a vaccine announced tomorrow, uh, the chances of getting that vaccine into society 
very quickly is very low. So therefore, they're taking, they're removing that debate that's happening every day, saying for this year, you're going to work at home, uh, even if there is a vaccine or anything, because we can't get it out to you as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think the opening has to be measured. I think we do need it because the basis of currency and economy, people have to work. Even if the unemployment surges to 40, 50 percent, you still need an economy that's working. We still need food supplies. We still need electricity in the homes. So the opening is the inevitable. It's just how do we open and how do we get it prepared? And eventually, you got to remember, everybody becomes an essential worker. The uh, person that's cutting the meat that you buy in a grocery store or the person that's fixing the electrical wiring outside your house, they become essential. Just if you lose electricity, he is essential uh, or she. So therefore, we have to have this measured approach. And I think those four variables are key. Uh, and we need a lot of dialogue on them, a lot of more information before we make that decision. So I sat in on a presentation by the chief economist of the Royal Bank uh, uh, last week, and he was saying that we're above 14% unemployment and that that is depression uh, era type uh, unemployment. Uh, you're saying 40, 50% uh, unemployment, but he was suggesting, you know, mid teens is bad enough. What do you think? Well, it, it is, we are in a quasi great depression uh, kind of era in a sense. Uh, unemployment, there's in the US, there's 36 million people that filed for uh, unemployment insurance. Um, that puts it around 14% unemployed. Uh, and that could spike to 20 or 25 um, because certainly many businesses, uh, like ours and others, have enough cash to sustain their employment for a certain period of time. But at some point in time, if they cannot go back to business generating revenue, a lot of the staff will not be needed uh, and you might uh, use the temporary unemployment uh, side of the law. Um, so it, it is uh, significant and it's going to get worse uh, from this point on. I mean, this is one of the problems with some of the government programs is that they're funding companies to keep employees, but uh, might as well they can give the employees the paycheck directly because the company is not benefiting. It's not generating a revenue stream. It's just a expense passes from the government to the company to the employee. Um, but I do suspect it's going to get higher from this point and probably hits 20, 25% unemployed. Now, really? 20 to 25% unemployment? What, in, in, in May or June? Uh, yeah, I would assume by, no, by July we will be, uh, our guesstimates, will be around that 20% mark. So even if we reopen and you're limited, uh, or Diane Francis is a little bit more uh, than limited, but still uh, not completely way, you think that unemployment could go up above uh, 20% and to maybe 25% by July? Yeah, absolutely. That, that limited uh, opening uh, focuses on certain businesses that are essential. But if you think of every restaurant that you know, or you go to uh, every event, that uh, shut down uh, eventually that that hasn't filtered to unemployment numbers yet now but there's good news and bad news the bad news is the percentage of unemployment is going to spike up but substantial portion of these are considered temporary unemployment not permanent so if you look at the statistics today while the unemployment number is at 14 percent or 15 percent uh only 20 percent of these people are considered permanently unemployed. The absolute majority is temporary unemployment, meaning their companies did let them go with the expectation of hiring them back within the next six months period. Now, this has two things. One is that companies are saying, we gotta do this to preserve cash and the government will take care of the unemployment insurance side of your salary, but we want you back. We wanna be ready. So that's one side of it. The other side is in the, uh, consumer confidence. Uh, that we need to have that high level of confidence that the unemployment is temporary in order for economy to normalize back quickly. So those are two important things. But yeah, I do suspect that unemployment will spike up uh, to that 20% uh, range. That's an unbelievably high uh, unemployment rate. Have we ever, you know, even in the Great Depression, uh, we've never been close to that, have we? I think we were at those levels in the Great Depression, uh, maybe even more. The difference is there was, uh, I believe there was a war going on and there 
was uh, different numbers that we couldn't track statistically, but I do believe where it was higher in those periods of time. But having said that, the uh, standard of living was totally different. The average family earned was totally different. So even in other periods, even if, uh, because numbers, uh, economists uh, are great in uh, calculating, crunching these numbers, but I'm pretty sure uh, these are based on statistical sampling. Some of them, when you go back to 1918, what was the unemployment number? Uh, whether they counted at that time, for example, women or people of different ethnicities, like totally different system that was there. So it's a lot of it is extrapolation of certain things. But uh, whether it's higher or less, the main issue is the standard of living. Today in North America and in the developing nations, we have a standard of living that is, is the real threat. It's, we were never concerned about unemployment. You go on unemployment insurance, there's always another job around the corner. There's something else coming up. We've survived and we've dealt with a lot of these issues before, whether during the dot-com bubble or the accounting scandals or the recession of 2008 or go to the 1987, the 1992. But we always had this temporary feeling in it, which allowed markets and economies to rebound. And this is why it's important that uh, companies continue to approach this as temporary unemployment and the consumer understands that the government is standing behind them to support them and there's no limit to that support. And do, which you, it think, seems do you think this is going to be seen as temporary? You know, you, you, uh, you've got, um, you mentioned restaurants that uh, are not going to be able to reopen. You've got uh, business owners of restaurants and, and workers in restaurants that uh, aren't going to be able to bounce back and get jobs. You've got uh, students that are graduating that are graduating into a market that doesn't have any jobs. You've got uh, college kids, uh, high school kids that were expecting summer jobs this summer that aren't going to get those summer jobs. Um, you've got uh, store owners that are going to be uh, uh, going bankrupt, that are going to not be able to meet lease payments, et cetera. Um, do you think this is going to be a temporary thing that we're going to bounce back from, or is this going to be a longer term negative impact that's going to go on for a, a while? Um, it's hard to answer in terms of the time, but definitely I don't think it's a B-shaped, a quick turnaround. I also do not think it will be prolonged 10 years uh, before we get to the bottom in terms of the employment cycle. Uh, I actually think it will be somewhere in the middle in terms of the timelines of it. Um, but in terms of uh, a lot of the, one of the advantages of our legal system is that it does allow you uh, if you are a first time bankrupt, for example, or you file for chapter 11 or restructuring, it does give you a, a second chance or, or an opportunity to continue as a going concern restructured while removing the debt. Uh, what's going to happen in the cycle, whether we wait till chapter 11 and bankruptcies and uh, the rebirth of your business, your restaurant under a new name, under new form, uh, whether we wait for that or the government steps in beforehand and says, uh, for this business or that business, which is happening in the U.S. and happening in Canada, uh, that we're going to step up and make sure the bankruptcy, the legal process of it does not occur. And I think that's a significant amount of money and effort is going towards that. But ultimately, if your local uh, corner store uh, doesn't get federal support or provincial support, they have no choice to get out of their debt beyond bankruptcy and a rebirth. Uh, and assuming they're first time bankrupt, uh, they, they'll just show up in another different name and another different uh, venue type of thing, but they can continue their business, they continue pursuing their entrepreneurial drive. Uh, but, uh, and that's what I suspect will happen quite a bit. Uh, if I've been doing some work for it. some. Uh event people and restaurant people recently. And uh, the things they're going through to try to figure out how to reopen in a, uh, in a manner consistent with physical distancing is unbelievable. Where they're talking about, you know, 30% of the capacity of the restaurant, they're talking about completely retrofitting their washrooms. Um, it's a substantial capital expenditure um, and it's uh, significantly less capacity. And they just don't know if they're gonna be able to make the numbers work ever. Yeah, it's, it's that cycle. So the restaurant will have to incur additional cost and at the same time lower revenue because, again, they no longer can seat that many people. Uh, and likewise, the building owner or the landlord 
has to accept a different formula for calculating their rent. Employees have to be paid partly by the government and partly by the employer. I think it, it triples effect into all aspects of the business. So this is a bigger problem than, let's say, the 2008 financial crisis. However, the government has stepped up and uh, in many ways are increasing their commitment. So when you say in the U.S. or Canada that they've already committed to spending 15% of their GDP, that is directly for payroll support. That's directly for supporting the businesses, which is something we're excited to see. And that's why stock markets have not vanished many of these companies that should be, they refer to them as zombie companies, that should be bankrupt, they're still kicking around and probably will still be kicking around for the next year or so. Uh, um, so that is, the, that is where uh, you might see uh, the government playing a bigger role than ever before and slowing down or flattening, up, flattening down that bankruptcy curve. Uh, in the language that's being commonly used today on healthcare, um, it does apply to any business where you could have a spike in bankruptcies and the government wants to flatten that curve uh, and uh, make sure businesses continue as a going concern. However, we guesstimate that almost 30%, 40% of the restaurants that we know uh, will not survive into 2021 if there's no vaccine found uh, by, by, let's say, the early four. 30 to 40% of the restaurants won't survive. That's a sobering, sobering thought. We're chatting with Hussein Ahmed, uh, the head of Yorkville Asset Management, uh, talking about the economy. We're going to take a quick break and uh, come back. And I'm going to ask him about some of the markets and what he expects to have happen. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour. We're chatting with Hussein Ahmed, Yorkville Asset Management. Hussein, um, What's going to happen to the stock market? Uh, I've been surprised at how uh, at how healthy uh, it has been. Um, you know, we had the big drop, uh, uh, I guess, early on in this COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, but then it seems to have recovered. Um, and you comment about zombie companies um, and flattening the curve. Um, are we just allowing companies that really should be bankrupt uh, to survive? And uh, you know, you think about the healthcare analogy you said, flattening the curve says we're all still gonna get infected, it's just gonna take longer for it to have uh, its impact. Is that gonna be the same thing from a company standpoint, is that we're still gonna have those bankruptcies, those companies still aren't gonna uh, survive, but it's gonna take longer to realize it. Absolutely, that's what we think what's going on. In fact, uh, equity markets have rebounded from the March 16th laws, laws. Uh, on the hopes that the government actions in terms of saying, one, we're going to lend almost everybody money, and two, we're going to backstop any major default uh, or risks. Uh, so naturally, equity markets have recovered. Uh, however, when you take a look, uh, you remove the stock prices and you look at earnings, for example, and revenue growth, you realize very quickly that it's going to be a challenging model. And when we say a zombie company, a company has to generate enough cash flow from its normal revenues to pay for its expenses and its interest and debt, debt obligations. Many of those companies, <clears throat> excuse me, do not generate enough cash to pay their interest and debt obligations, even in an environment where we have almost close to zero interest rates. Uh, and what we've seen after the announcement from the feds in the month of uh, April and early May, a surge in companies going out, raising debt, and investors are giving them the money because investors say, uh, if the government is going to go backstop this failure, I would lend. Uh, the, the challenge in this, the government is saying, we plan on backstopping everybody, but they have not made it contractual, meaning they have not said, for company A that borrows, I will guarantee their debt obligation. And they could let some companies fail, uh, no different than what happened in 2008, where, for example, they uh, decided to uh, help some banks, but decided to let Lehman Brothers go bankrupt, Burst yeah. Stearns go bankrupt, Wachovia. So uh, without that written guarantee, people are functioning on statements and testimonials in front of Congress and Senate, congressional hearings, um, but it's not specific to any company. And there was a surge in the month of April in companies raising debt both high yield and investment green. Everybody's sharing up their cash. Um, and if you can finance uh, your operations by debt instead of revenue, uh, you delay your bankruptcy in many cases. 
and if you delay your bankruptcy, there's an element of hope and reality that maybe things will get corrected quickly and you go back to normal. But if this stretch, uh, you can raise that once, but if there's no revenue, you can't raise that again, and uh, the problems become bigger. What about uh, some of the commodity markets, gold, silver, oil? What do you think about those markets? Yeah, they're, they've been extremely volatile. Uh, we do have, uh, just uh, for uh, full disclosure, we do have a substantial portion of our many of our portfolios that hold physical gold and some of the gold companies. This is, we, we do it as a natural hedge on currencies and economies and zero interest rate environment. In fact, negative interest rate environment. When you have that, zero interest rate environment should be good for gold. Uh, commodities in general have been very volatile. So if you take a look at oil, the swings that has been experienced in oil in the past month, we have not seen probably, go, you gotta go back before I was born uh, to find those swings. We didn't experience them even during wartime and supply disruption and all that stuff. So they're very volatile and investors have to be careful. Many investors uh, were lost a lot of money over oil in, in the past few weeks because lack of understanding how a commodity work versus a stock works. The stock trades differently than a commodity, um, but we expect volatility across all commodities. However, some commodities should do very well. For example, gold and precious metals in a historically in zero interest rate environment, they tend to do very well. Oil is very much driven by global demand. So as the economy open up slowly or faster or accelerates, we might see the price of uh, oil stabilizes and starts moving higher. It's already have moved higher in expectation of this reopening. But again, probably it's uh, uh, equilibrium price should be in the mid 40s. And today it's in the low 30s. So it has about $10 to move, but that is subject to uh, demand coming up and also supply uh, remaining relatively contained in terms of the deals between Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the US. So if, uh, if supply doesn't spike up, uh, then we do have a recovery in oil that can be sustainable. And what, what about real estate, both uh, residential and uh, commercial? What's your expectation there? Um, that's a, a big challenge for everybody in the market and the market is polarized on one side you have the big players like uh, Brookfield, BlackRock, that are the largest real estate investors. Uh, they're saying uh, there's plenty of opportunity. They have a lot of cash to buy, to redevelop, to, uh, to do whatever. Uh, that's on one side. In the same side, they're saying we're putting $5 billion relief fund for our tenants because they know the tenants cannot pay the rent. And the value of any real estate has to do with the cash flow generates. So uh, you get that one side of it, then you get the other side of it, which is the individuals, which make up the majority of the market, that they'll be hard pressed to take a mortgage, uh, ex a, enlarge their debt when the future is unknown about the recovery, about unemployment. And also we hear stories that banks themselves uh, are not giving mortgages that easily anymore. Uh, so the market is drying up. So you get the both sides of it. At one point in time, one side will win over the other. We've seen it in the 1990s, where actually the side, the negative side of this eventually won and the real estate prices corrected substantially. Uh, I think it was 91, 92. And in other areas since that period of time, it tends to be more uh, the funds that have a lot of cash that can buy anything because of liquidity uh, have been winning. So this time it's a little bit uncertain, but I, if, if we are gonna guesstimate uh, based on the number we see, we do expect a correction in real estate prices. Just we don't know the magnitude of it because we do not know this unemployment, is it temporary, is it permanent, uh, more permanent in nature instead of 20% being temporary, is it uh, permanent, sorry, is it more? We do not know if the opening up and generating revenue in malls and plazas, uh, is going to happen in August or is it going to happen in January next year? So at this moment in time, both sides are in balance a little bit. And at the, you got to keep in mind that there is no transactions. There's nobody going out shopping for a house. There is no uh, uh, very few showings. You can't even probably go I see in, into a house at this moment in time. So the market is in total uh, halt, um, but we do expect 
prices to crack a little bit on the low to the lower end. Hussein Ahmed, Yorkville Asset Management. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I uh, really appreciate your thoughts. I, uh, I think this is our third chat uh, once a month since COVID-19 started. Let's keep up the tradition and meet again sometime in June. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thanks, Hussein. Well, that's uh, the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Um, I'll give you my thoughts. I think that uh, we have to open up. I think that uh, you know any good healthcare system needs a good tax base uh, to support it. And so therefore keeping things shut down um, is uh, forever is, is clearly or, uh, or even for a longer time period is, is the wrong strategy. I think that um, uh, Diane Francis is right, that people um, younger than 60, younger than 50 that uh, don't have pre-existing uh, uh, conditions uh, don't seem to, uh, to uh, die, uh, do get sick, uh, and the sickness uh, tends to be a little bit more um, impactful than the flu, but, but it's not uh, something that they die from. Uh, and so therefore, um, you know, you go back to chicken pox and, uh, and, and diseases of the past. People used to have chicken pox parties where they'd uh, get together to, uh, to get uh, infected um, such that uh, the kids uh, would, uh, would have the antibodies such that they wouldn't get infected later on in life. And I'm not suggesting that we do that, but uh, somehow we've got to, uh, to get more people um, that uh, are immune. And whether that's through a vaccine that uh, I don't think is going to come for a year or two, uh, and or through uh, infection uh, in, uh, in enough people in the population, or through things like masks. Uh, you know, I heard this one interesting study that said that if 60% of the people wear masks and the masks are 60% effective, that in a couple of weeks, uh, it wouldn't be able to, the, the infection wouldn't be able to transfer enough. And so we probably haven't done enough in regards to isolating the people that are infected, isolating the people that uh, are vulnerable, and, uh, and allowing the rest of society to get on with it. And uh, probably my biggest complaint is that we've been closing down parks and, uh, and restricting access to parks. And so people got to get out and they got to build up their immune system. So we need to reopen. Um, I agree with Hussein. It's got to be in a reasonable uh, manner. It's got to be over time. But we've got to get our economy working again because people aren't going to survive if they don't have jobs, if they don't have money, if they don't have income. We can't just all rely on debt and government to and debts. Anyway, that's my uh, two cents worth. Brian Crombie and the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Thanks to Diane Francis and Hussein Ahmed for joining us. Good night, everybody.